Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Elevate Your Grind brought to you by the Cannabis Lab. Again, I'm your host, Todd Rosales. I'm going to introduce myself every show, but by now you should know who I am. Guys, we've got an absolute awesome uh, episode for you today. Uh, I'm super excited to talk about this product, to talk about this company, to talk to the person who created all of it because I did a little stint in a similar injury in industry before getting into cannabis. So it's something that is really intrigued me. But as always, you know, I like to give a little tease, even though I don't know why I do that. I post who's going to be on the show. I tell you guys all day long who's going to be on the show. And then all of a sudden at five o'clock, I decide that you don't know who's going to be on the show. That's not smart. But you know what? I enjoy it. So I'm going to still do it. Guys, so we are on episode two of three, four episodes this week. I really got to stop committing to doing so much, but it's a lot of fun and we've got great guests. So we're going to continue to do it. Uh, tomorrow, we've got Christian Shank from Driven Deliveries. That's going to be at 5 p.m. Eastern. And then we have Erica Daniels for Hope Grows for Autism. Uh, we might have to move Erica's episode because we do have our legal panel tomorrow at 6 p.m. It's going to be a great legal update. Um, again, I know it has more of a formal title. And one of these days, I'm going to go look at what that formal title is. But at the end of the day, it's legislative updates, it's legal updates, it's a state of the union of what's going on in the cannabis industry across the country, and you should be there. If you want to be there, check it out at joinclab.com, register for the event. You can put that you are my guest, Todd Rosales, or you can use the code CLAB100. All right, my guest today is bringing the cannabis industry to the bleeding edge of technology. So when this industry was legalized, right, um, companies had a rare opportunity to really take something that didn't exist before and not only make it legal and make it kind of normal, but because of our given point in time with the technology available, they kind of became a showcase for what retail should be, right? And the guest that we have today is somebody who's making that happen. I'm really excited to talk to him about it. Please welcome Jeremy Jacobs, the chairman and CEO of Enlighten. Jeremy, thanks hey. for joining us, man. Hey, Todd, thanks for having me. I was excited. I think you're the only man in the cannabis industry that has the same energy level that I do. So I was wondering if we just would melt this entire podcast today or not. So we'll find out. Well, that's, that's why they're keeping us in separate locations. It's not coronavirus. It's the combined energy together would have burned down the studio. It's so. a government conspiracy. That's what it is. It has to be, man. <laughs> so, dude, you, you have an absolute incredible journey, right? Coming from, from the gas industry and then getting into, uh, you know, getting into really digital advertising, menu boards. It's kind of... I don't even know what to call the industry because it spans so much. It can encounter advertising, education, um, uh, marketing, all these different things. But this all started, I'm assuming, after you got out of the gas business. I heard a story that you said you took a TV off your wall, you put yeah. it up in a restaurant, you started selling ads, and you never looked back. Yeah, so it's, a, it's an interesting story. Uh, I was in the natural gas, crude oil, and mining industry. I had a big company, Jacobs Energy, Sandcastle Quarry, 280-something uh, wells in eastern Kentucky. We were doing a good job. And then 2008 came, and the markets just collapsed. The real estate market in California collapsed. That created a trickle across the economy. And uh, what happened was natural gas went from $14 in MCF to like $1.40. And I needed it to be at least $3 to, to even break even. And so literally I'm, I'm sitting here going broke. I've laid off all my employees. None of my drill rigs are busy. The entire industry I've ever worked for just went down the swirly tube. And I'm trying to figure out what I'm gonna do. And an idea came and I literally stole, it's, it's a 32 inch Vizio TV. I still own it. It's in like a museum that we have here of old technology. This was two, circa 2008. My wife says, where are you going my TV? And I said, I'll be back in a week. <laughs> with a bigger TV. And she says in a week and I just leave and I go to my hometown in Kentucky, a little small town, 6,000 people. And I installed the TV in a restaurant that was one of the busiest places in the city. And I went around to the local politicians and sold ads. And in the first week I did about $10,000 in ad sales and said, there's something here. And nice. so we just began to expand. Uh, we put up a hundred screens pretty quickly within a month or two. And that was 2008. And then to flash forward, uh, you know, a little bit later, we invented the digital menu, uh, you know, where you can update your, your price listings, you know, via POS system and, and replace static menu boards. Started selling those through Cisco Foods. 
Later, we we built a digital directories to replace those little black felt boards with the little white things you poke into it. And when you're okay. out of M's, you flip the W upside down. You got a big bow-legged M on the, <laughs> on the board. Yeah. So we made those touch screens and then Signorama and a bunch of sign suppliers, like 1,500 shops throughout the world started selling those for us. And so really built a big company out of nothing. Um, you know, in the beginning, I was installing, designing, programming, all that. And, you know, now there's there's dozens of people probably a hundred people at this point that work around here and we're in just about every industry but enlighten was born about six years ago uh, when colorado legalized cannabis recreationally and i got a call from a guy that worked for me uh, and he was selling us digital menus through Cisco Foods. They would recommend clients to us and they would sell our menu systems and he would be the one to go service that. And he says, what are you thinking about making digital menus and, and uh, digital signage for cannabis? And I said, it sounds like the coolest thing I could ever do. You know, that's the two things yeah. I love, digital technology and cannabis. And that's where it began. And, and we were like anyone else. We entered the market not having any idea what was, none of us knew what was going on. We were all making the rules up as we went along. I just knew that nobody could advertise anywhere in the marijuana industry. You couldn't buy a billboard at the time. You know, you might be able to buy Westward Magazine and a few others like Rooster Magazine, but there was no other advertising space available anywhere. And so we were helping to create ad space so brands could reach consumers and dispensaries could reach consumers. And, and that's where it was started was identifying a need and beginning to fill it. And obviously now we got, you know, dozens of products. We have 1500 clients in 33 states, but you know, that's where it began was Denver, Colorado, day one, ground zero. Dude, that's so cool because, you know, I look at it and there's so many different ways that people enter the space, right? All of us that are, that are cannabis users or patients or advocates or whatever you want to call us, sure. you know, especially when you're a little bit older, you've established a career, you, you're, you've gotten good at something, you've established an income, you know, you built your business, it wasn't in cannabis space yet, and then all of a sudden the cannabis industry knocks on your door and you're like, well, hell yeah, we've got to do this. I mean you know, that, that's got to be an amazing day where you can take your passion for what you're doing every day for a living and combine it with your passion for cannabis. Well, it's fun for me because there's only four or five companies internationally that really have the tech chops and, you know, the facilities we've got at this point as an organization to compete with us in digital signage and digital menus. And I know all of those owners, most of them, and they're not going to get into cannabis. That's the exact opposite mentality that they have. Yeah. And here, I, you know, I was the executive director of Kentucky Normal trying to legalize cannabis. I've been a cannabis patient, you know, since I was 14 years old, pretty faithfully. And so for me, it was, I was glad they were out of the way and I could just move right in. And I felt like the industry really needed real tech. And there, no offense to the startups. The startups are great. Everybody's got to start somewhere. But, you know, having somebody in the industry that if you want to buy a premium, products that have been tried true tested you know being able to inject that legitimacy into the industry has been an important thing for me yeah i mean there there's a you know there's a list of companies that are doing things i mean i so i personally i work in the it space these days back in system erps all that boring stuff but you know the main players in that space your oracles your microsoft those guys they're not touching this space and because of that we are having people that are developing things from scratch for this industry, which is great because it's designed for this industry. But on the other end of that, like you said, it hasn't been tried. It hasn't been tested. It's still right. going through the growing pains, right? You already have these solutions. You happen to be the owner of the company too and a cannabis advocate. So you're like, hell yeah, I'll go touch that space and I'm going to go That's thrive good. in that space. That is so cool. And I think back in the day, I was very similar to the gentleman who worked for you. So I worked for a company and we did, um, I forget, I, 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 apparently I wasn't very good at it because I forget the pitch, but we did <laughs> uh, advertising stats for sure. out of home advertising, right? So billboards, digital billboards, signage anywhere. And I think you have this integrated into your system where we can figure out how many people were around your board, how long they were around your board for, how often they came back. And I can see you nodding that you know. And I remember one of the first things that we thought was, well, I'm like, well, I'm going to go attack cannabis brands because they're going to want to know this stuff. And I remember the first call I made, and I, I give them a lot of shit now, was MedMen. And it was when they were allowed to buy. Everybody gives them a lot of shit, Todd. It's okay. <laughs> yeah. I feel bad, but, you know, so I, uh, I called up MedMen. I got to their, their PR company. I said, you need this on the billboards that you guys are buying. And they're like, let me tell you a story, Todd. 
we buy whatever freaking billboard we can get our hands on because we're only about to buy so many of them, right? So that kind of discouraged me. And then when we started getting into, I think we we're kind of chasing you. We got we we didn't have the whole board system. We were a device that went on the board. So you probably have talked to people like this. And I'm like, all right, we're gonna put these in the dispensaries. But I went to the first dispensary and I'm like, well, they take my license at the front. They know when I'm there. They know when I check out. There's probably no need for this. And I kind of talked myself out of it. You didn't do that. And apparently, this I'm assuming this is a very big feature of part of your menu boards sure right is. now. Sure is. So, so there's really, to, to dive into that discussion, it, it requires us to back up slightly. So Enlighten started off giving away these free TVs and that tracking device that was a measurement tool to count the number of people that saw those advertisements. That was the primary function, was to create legitimacy through measurability. Like if you buy an ad on the internet, you know a server got pinged and that ad got delivered. Yeah. They, now you don't know if it was a, a click farm in China necessarily, but we wanted to create that same sort of legitimacy. And nobody was doing that, not just in cannabis, but in just digital out of home in general. And we wanted that. Measurability was new to the entire industry of digital at home. So we created a device, runs on a Raspberry Pi. Now it can run on a Windows or any machine running on basically any OS. And it can sniff packets in the atmosphere. And we could count the number of phones that were nearby that device. And so neat things we can do. We can... Uh, measure how long somebody's there. We can measure how frequently they return. So we know visitor return frequency. Are you a dispensary that mainly sees one-off tourists like, you know, the uh, Euflora on 16th Street Mall? You know, that's a big tourist spot. A lot of tourists yeah. go to that place. Where, you know, like Dank in Colorado, Greg Gamut, Justin Jones, and Jay Griffin and those guys, that's a local shop. You know, people, they, they I walk in there, I, I go to Denver right now, I walk in there, I, I bet I know half the people in there shopping because I've seen yeah. them doing for years and so you can detect those things but really to back up um and to think about what enlighten is we're two things now we're a marketing company which is what you really know me as with digital out of home and the fact that we can serve two billion ad impressions at the point of purchase at that last six inches at per before a purchase is made and reach all those consumers but there's also that retail solution side where we make digital menu software as a service we make e-commerce software self-service kiosks and all the hardware and stuff to go with that and so this this traffic product has a life in both you know it has an ability uh, for digital out-of-home advertising to detect how many people are there to create legitimacy and measurability for advertisers. But dispensaries want to know this information. They want to know how they're doing compared to their neighbors. They want to know how they're doing compared to this quarter last year or this month last year or whatever that might be, this period last year. And so, you know, it's it's got a second life. And so you should have kept going. You shouldn't have gotten discouraged. You should have should have kept at it. Yeah, but then I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you. And as much as I, I love the gentleman I work for, Justin Gilfis, one of the best bosses I ever had, but I, I enjoy doing this show so much more. Um, but yeah, man, it, it's a really cool technology. And actually, I will say, I've spoke to Justin, and I know that, that iOS and Android came up with an update, if you guys were doing it the same way that we did, that made it, we couldn't get past. Um, so you guys have to be doing something a little bit different than we are if you're still able to do it. We don't need to, few, to reveal the secret sauce here in front of everybody. but We're doing a few different things with our in-store technology, and we're also augmenting it now. There's just so much location data that's available without having a piece of hardware. Now, I can tell you how many inches somebody gets from a screen, and you know, POI data from geofencing or whatever is never going to be able to do that. But you know, for me, the future of understanding traffic is really about taking all the data points because none of them are 100% correct. You know, certain people might have Wi-Fi turned off. Some people might have location service turned off. But collectively, we can get a better picture. And for me, that's what it's about. It's about making less extrapolations and compiling more and more data. That's a, and that's a big deal for us. Data, data, data. Uh, that's really cool. And I can probably get, get into this nerd stuff even deeper, but I don't want to lose our audience here. So I right. think one of the cool things that you do in Enlighten is, is – basically create an experience within the dispensary. You know, as I mentioned, when we first come up, came on, you know, you, you are bringing the cannabis industry to the bleeding edge of technology from a retail standpoint, right? This might be new to some people in cannabis, but 
you know, companies like Chick-fil-A and, and, and uh, all these, you know, restaurants and everything else have been doing stuff like this forever, having digital menu boards. I can't tell you how many times I'm in a restaurant or a fast service restaurant where they have a digital menu board and then they flash something covered in cheese on the screen. And I'm just like, Ooh, I'm going to order that. That's right. It about. changes yep. the experience. So, yeah, and- but you get, Sorry, you guys are doing this at dispensaries now, and you're almost kind of like, I'll call it Disney World in the experience, because when you show up to a dispensary, you're probably going to wait for a little bit, maybe a few minutes, maybe longer than that, but you're taking that as an opportunity to engage with customers before they're even engaging with your sta- with the staff of the dispensary, That's which right. I think is That's really right. cool. Yeah, and, and it's what you alluded to in the beginning is it you know you didn't even really know how to classify it because sometimes it's promotion sometimes it's education and that's what it's about too it's not just about having the ability because there's a lot of companies out there that have the ability to put a computer on the back of a tv and mount it up on a wall that's not that's not hard you know any teenager in their basement can do that but how do you curate an experience how do you understand what consumers are looking for and so we have a library at this point of contents over a thousand individual pieces and they follow different categories. Uh, in the education category, we've got trivia segments. We've got how-to segments, like how to make a bong, how to clean a bong, how to decarb uh-huh. cannabis for baking with it. We've got uh, trivia segments, which of the following U.S. presidents grew cannabis? What is, which one of the following plants is most similar to cannabis? Hops would be, you know, it's a close cousin to, to cannabis. Uh, and then it, there's segments on, you know, what is a terpene? What, what are different terpenes do? And then there's an entire lifestyle section of content that's just different videos like you know you've seen the uh, marijuana millionaire show you've seen the cannabis version cannabis cribs you know all of these producers if you're a producer of content you're watching reach out to us we have a huge platform we reach more cannabis consumers than anyone period i don't care if they're a website or what they are we're in over a thousand locations and broadcast this people can't change the channel on us and we also have an ott website at cannabis club tv and so that's why people engage with our brand is because we're tapping into the things that are important. People want to be entertained. They want to be educated. And as a dispensary owner, you want that too, because the more you know about a product, the higher end products you buy. Like for example, you probably got a hobby. A lot of guys do golf. I don't do golf. I'm from Kentucky. I competitively shoot guns. I play fiddle. I do Kentucky kind of things. But you know, my first (laughs) fiddle cost 50 bucks. You know, the fiddle I play on now, we're not even talking about what I paid for it. We're just not even going to get into it. But the reason that, you know, I, I buy that quality of a product is because I get the difference and you get the difference through education. And so that's what we do for dispensaries is we elevate the, the understanding of the product line. We make it more important than it was to them the day before. They spend more of that currency on it. And for the brands, we give them that, that point of exposure. And, and excitingly enough, you caught me, and I'll probably get murdered by my lawyer, but got a big update coming uh, early September. We built a portal to the cannabis consumer unlike anything anybody's ever seen if you're wanting to reach cannabis consumers watch out for us in september we got a platform coming where you can self-service it's just like like going to google adwords man and you can buy ads to mobile devices to in-store screens to all of these places and you can reach that cannabis consumer just just click the buttons pick the criteria of who you're looking for and bam the ad is running so very exciting stuff in the future for that Dude, I've been circling around all the things that you've been doing for the past few years. I got a friend of mine who built a similar ad network for a company down here in Florida, not for cannabis, but just for for conservative news. Uh, Dude, I mean, what you built is absolutely incredible and so needed by our industry, right? There's so, here's the thing is the way that I typically handle this show is I'll do my research, I'll ask my questions and I'll, I'll dig into some things that you say while you're talking. Every sentence you have, I'm like, there are 10 different options I can go down here, and I don't know which way to go down. But, you know, going to the educational thing, what I love about what you guys are doing with the educational thing is I'm a big fan of bringing the general public into our world. And I right. think when cannabis was first it. – Exactly. Fighting the stigma. We're all, we're all about that, right? Yeah. And what I think is when cannabis was first legalized, a lot of the OGs and a lot of the people that have been fighting this battle their whole life – They're like, we want to bring you in, but we want to bring you in our way, right? Right. Talk to you about our lifestyle and everything else. We've got to a point where we're like, all right, we don't want to drag you in kicking and screaming. 
we want to educate you and kind of tell you all the different things that you can do with it and give you that education so you can make your own decisions. So when I think about the experience of bringing a friend who doesn't have the experiences that I do to a dispensary, I would more likely choose one that has your technology in it because while we're waiting, they're going to get that education, right? I can talk to them and say, yeah, that is true. Or I, you know, I have experience with that. But what I also like through education, people like you and me, we started with cannabis. Let's be honest. We used it as a drug. We liked the way that it felt. We didn't know that it was wellness. We didn't know that sometimes it helps you concentrate. We didn't know that it can do all these different things. But over time, by using it, and then the legality came, we started educating ourselves on it. The way that I use cannabis today versus the way I used it when I was 22, 23 is exponentially different, right? And so it's not only are you educating different. the general, 100%. You're not just educating the general public. You're also educating the traditional cannabis consumer as well, too, which I think is very valuable. Well, you were talking a second ago about the OGs wanted to bring people into cannabis, but they wanted them to bring them in their own way. And, and I, if you watch other interviews, I talk about the tie-dye t-shirts and the Jimi Hendrix and Grateful Dead posters. And, you know, it's, it was, it, and that, I'm not trying to stereotype the whole thing, but that's the majority of what a lot of the world looked at stoners as, cannabis consumers, you know, reefers, reefer heads. And so that's sort of the stigma that was placed on it. And if you look at the last few years, uh, two years ago, the largest growing demographic of cannabis consumers was a 40 year old soccer mom with, a, with two kids. And then in this last year, it's been senior citizens, like these baby boomers. They were smoking weed back yeah. in the seventies and now it's legal and they don't have a job anymore. They're all retired, they're returning to it. And they're drinking teas and playing bridge with each other. And the soccer mom is inviting her buddies over instead of having wine down Wednesday where they get drunk and have a hangover on Thursday, they're all coming over. And she's making some chicken marsala with a butter that she made out of cannabis. And it's an entirely different experience. And so you can't tell people, Cannabis is too big. It's so big. It's one of the biggest things ever. And you can't say this is cannabis. Cannabis is whatever someone wants to make it. And so as the stewards of the industry, it's our job to just give them the information. It's like Walter Cronkite used to do with the news, right? He read the news. He didn't tell you yeah. what he thought about it. He didn't put a spin on it. He said, this is what happened today. That's our job is to not spin it. Here it is. Here's what cannabis is. A hundred years this plant's been illegal, even though it was used for 20,000 years. And no, none of us know anything about it. I know more than my doctor, my nurses, and anybody in this entire city in most cases. And, and so it's our job to give this information and let people decide what they're going to do with it. That's not, I don't have that right. That's not my choice. To yeah. make. Let them make that decision. Cannabis is what everybody wants it to be. And I, you were beating up med men earlier, but to tie this all together, what MedMen did with that Spike Lee thing, the, you know, the new normal, yeah. that, that says it. Like, there's not a better way in 90 seconds to, to tell that story. And, and so it is the new normal, but it's going to be normal in whatever way each individual consumer wants it to be normal. Well, listen, we can beat up MedMen all we want, but at the end of the day, they were one of the first people to come to the table and say, this is the new normal. We're here to show you that. And, and you know, they kind of were pioneers in that sense. You know, we don't need to get into the details of what's happened to them since, yeah. but you know, they went out there and they went out on a limb and we've always got to give them credit for it. But yeah, I'm not, not here to judge know, anyone. I don't want to be judged. Not judging anybody. They did what they did and they, they got us started for sure. I got to say though, the, the world has picked up that term new normal and I hate it now. I hate yeah. it so much because everybody uses it all the time, but yep. it's here. It, it's the new normal now. So I hope, I hope my new normal is not wearing a mask everywhere I go. So let's hope that's not true. I hope my new normal, I hope this is the new normal isn't I'm sitting in my office every day talking to folks like you. I can't wait to get back out and start doing this in person again, <laughs> right. going and showing the technologies that you're using. Um, circling Next back into the... Nope. Next time we're at an event together, we need to get together. I've got a 46 foot long uh, uh, mobile marijuana dispensary. It's an RV. We convert it into a, a showcase for all of our products. And in the back, there's a private studio and we do podcast interviews and stuff. So we'll have to get together next time we see each other. Very cool. I, I, so I, I, there is an awesome podcast and I am not about, you know, I don't mind advertising other podcasts on the show that you were on. Um, the lady out of Texas, I forget her name, but let's be blunt. 
And I heard you yeah. talking to her and is, she did a great job interviewing you. And I've got a lot of the information from her, but the coolest thing that I heard you talk about was the $2,000 <laughs> exhaust system that you put on the bus to be able to clear all the smoke out of it. Because I've been thinking about that forever. If I was ever going to build a podcast studio, we don't do a ton of consumption on this show, but who am I to tell somebody that they can't? I'm like, if I do a studio, I really got to look into an exhaust system. So I was fascinated. I'm like, yeah, I'll I, I was, send you the that spec. was the most interesting. Well, what got me is I, I, there was a guy here, a friend of mine, he lives in Denver now, and uh, Lucas Davis is his name. And I said, Lucas, I need you to make it so that if we're in a show and somebody decides to fire up the joint in this thing, I don't got to be the asshole and say, put that out. We can just let it ride, even though we're inside a convention center, and just, and just you know, not be that negative Nancy. And he said, I'll find one, boss. And so he goes after it, and he found the world's most sophisticated ventilation system. And what got me is that the, the video, it shows the CEO of the company is in a clear container. And there's a little door on the side. These guys in these flak jackets look like they're going to bum rush up and bust somebody up. They shoot these smoke grenades into this container, and it's filling up, and the CEO sticks his head down next to the thing. And then, like, seven minutes later, all the smoke is cleared, and he's still alive. And I was like, that's the one I want. And so it's this <laughs> gigantic thing. And we put it to the test. We were in Vegas at MJ BizCon. Uh, we provided the consumption lounge because technically in most states, this thing is legal to consume in because it's, Very it's considered cool. a dwelling. So we're on private property, even if I'm in a parking lot, and which was part of why we got it. And so we're, we're there, and there were, I, I think it was about 600 grams is what we consumed that night in the bus. And it, you know, you stand outside of it, you couldn't smell it. So it's incredible. That's crazy. Dude, that, that's an awesome bus. Well, I definitely can't wait to check that bus out for sure. Um, I miss conventions, man. You know, it's weird. Uh, I used to hate going to conferences and everything else until I got into this industry, and now they're some of the most fun you could have. But, you know, really looking forward to those coming back. I want to I wanna continue to talk about Enlighten because what you guys did was absolutely incredible. I harp on this all the time that getting into this industry, and, and you've talked about it in interviews, your marketing playbooks don't work anymore. If you're a digital marketer, if you're a chief marketing officer and you come in from any other space coming into cannabis, your Facebook playbook doesn't work. Your Instagram playbook doesn't work. No social media playbooks work. You can't buy Google ads. You can't really pay for advertising. Even you know, folks like me, I'm literally just a freaking podcast. There has nothing to do with plant touching here. If we do one paid ad for our show, we'll get flagged and we'll get removed, right? What you did is said, screw that. And you built your own advertising network. You built it multifaceted. You built it physical with in-store displays and sides. You built it on mobile. You're building it on the web. Literally just multi-touch. No matter how this consumer gets their information, you have a platform. And it sounds like in right. September, it's going to get even better that you can put information in front of this consumer. That's absolutely incredible. And not only that, the coolest thing about it is I see a lot of these advertising platforms that pop up. And the first thing I think is, you know, when cannabis goes legal, Google's just going to take that over. But with the, oh. with the network that you guys have built physically within physical locations, it doesn't matter when cannabis becomes legal and the big boys come in, you're already there. Your infrastructure is there. Someone's coming from way behind to even catch up with you, dude. I mean, well, I can in most cases, so you're right. We call it our moat. So we knew that, you know, if, if selling web ads is kind of a dime a dozen, selling digital ads, there's, there's a million DSPs that do that. And so having a DSP wasn't really the important thing, but b being able to gain the physical real estate was going to be the most important thing. Because the one thing I know for sure, Todd, is I can run a marijuana ad inside of a marijuana dispensary. There's no doubts about that. This age gate, yeah. this person's 21. And so by installing physical hardware and contracting these locations, that's our real estate basically forever. We, it, it's ours to lose. We have to mess up to, to not yeah. add value. And come January 1, first quarter, I've got some surprises for my dispensary partners. It's going to blow their minds, the value that we're going to be giving them at no cost. And we'll talk about that in a, in a later podcast. But, yeah, that's our moat. And so that moat establishes – what is the largest base of cannabis consumers reachable on the planet, period. 
like if you're a national brand, let's say you're Cure Leaf, or let's say you're not even a cannabis brand. A lot of our dollars come from outside of cannabis, like Van Shoes. Why wouldn't they want to advertise the cannabis community? Absolutely. Hulu, you know, delivery services. These are some of our big customers. For ads, you want to reach a cannabis consumer. I deliver two plus billion ad impressions on an annual basis, and we're doing it when they're in that particular mindset. So as you said, yes, we can't be removed. And so then really the second step is to kind of figure out who these cannabis consumers are and not only be able to advertise to them while they're in the dispensary, because Nielsen says five to seven impressions is what it takes for your brand to be sticky. On average, I'm getting three and a half while they're in the store. The, the rotation of ads and the, the dwell time accounts about three and a half. So I need to get them once they leave. So through some of that real cool technology we're not going to talk about today, we're able to identify these consumers. And so when you leave the dispensary, I'm able to offer you a continuation campaign that literally follows them out of the dispensary. So as they leave, your ad goes with them, just like that product did. And nobody's doing these sorts of things. And so like you said, even if Google comes in or Facebook or whoever, it doesn't make any difference. There's, there's too much actual hard technology. It's not yeah. like we're just buying data like everybody else. We physically have hard technology. So we have an asset that the only way to get to it is through us. We are the gatekeepers and the key masters. And so if you want to reach those consumers in that store, you, you got to come to the portal. Bottom line. Dude, it, it, it is absolutely incredible. I mean, as, as a business, there's just so many different ways that you can both add value and monetize for yourself. It, it really it's a perfect storm, man. You, you, I, I, I'm, I'm just so impressed. Not saying I'm not impressed that you did. I'm impressed that this business, like it just seems like such a simple concept, but you created your own network. You don't need to work with TV channels or, or websites or anything else. It is my network. It's my real estate. And you know, it, it really is the, if you build it, they will come model. A lot of entrepreneurs talk trash about that, but you built it, they're coming. And not only you're not just fighting the bloody battle of, okay, how do I get all these dollars from the cannabis companies that all of us are trying to fight for, including myself as a podcast host. You're like, all right, van shoes, come on board. I'm sure you get supplement companies because cannabis users for the most part, shockingly are wellness users too. You know, I, I can only see, I mean, you would think that people would probably stereotype and say, oh, you must get Netflix, Taco Bell, and Snickers advertising. But, um, you know, I'm sure you've got some great mainstream companies. I looked on your website. I saw, you know, Showtime is advertising with you guys. I think. Absolutely, yeah. So a yeah. couple things about what you said I want to point out. One is it was a lot harder than it sounds. It sounds like it would be easy to give away free TVs to, to <laughs> cannabis dispensaries. But I got I to gotta be honest, like, that is literally the hardest thing I've ever done. And it's because really? in, other, in other industries I've done it, like I built a thousand screen payday network in three weeks because we were able to call up one payday loan company that had a thousand stores. I, I visited, I bought a guy lunch twice, took him out, went to his daughter's horseback riding thing. And the next morning we signed and boom, I have access to a thousand stores. Like literally no one has a thousand stores. Cureleaf is just now getting to a hundred. GTI is coming up yeah. on that number pretty close. So there's no scale. So first off, I just want to pinpoint that is an excruciatingly challenging task. That and yeah. every one of them has specific ask and specific needs that you really just weren't prepared for. And unrealistic expectations to add to that. So there's that. The, the other point is about the point that you're making about th these endemic advertisers. And so it was a really key point. So we've actually captured that cannabis audience. And what's interesting is there are a lot of mainstream brands that want to align with cannabis consumers. Just wait until 420 hits and go check everybody's Twitter and Instagram out. They all tip the hat and pay homage to cannabis. They all got their snarky little joke, you know. Uh, but some of them literally will, will dive wholeheartedly into this thing. And when you look at companies like Vans and Showtime and who, whoever, when you look at these companies, their weekly marketing budgets are generally greater than the total annual gross revenues of the largest company in cannabis. 
And so the dollars to them are just insignificant. Do I think that will evolve and change? Absolutely. Right now, and non-endemic customers are big customers for us. They got lots of money. They understand the value of what we're doing. They're not strapped for cash. They're not in a startup phase. They're big boys. And they, and they know how to penetrate. They know how to track attribution. They know what we're doing is working. And, but cannabis companies, you know, we do have special rates for them and they are catching up and, and it is, they are building better marketing teams. I'm, I'm sitting in meetings now with chief marketing officers that have actually been chief marketing officers somewhere legitimate. You know, they, they, they get the dynamics of it. And so as the industry matures, we're ready for them. You know, we're, we're here. We've, we've got the model. We've got the technology. We've, we're ready to go. We're here to serve. I imagine that, you know, amongst that, that the, you know, the grinding that you had to do that there was a ton of education needed, right? Yeah. You know, like, because here's the thing, you and I are talking about this, and I just so happen to have worked a little bit in that industry. So I have a general understanding of it. But before I got into that industry, it, all this blew my mind, right? So I can only imagine you now in the cannabis space. And like you said, it wasn't somebody who was a CMO at Pepsi or somewhere else. I'm sure when that happens now, you're kind of like, okay, at least I can start at 25% because he kind of knows where I'm coming from instead yeah. of having to educate him from the beginning. But those first conversations must have been, you the really heart. had to do a lot of education on what you do. Yeah, you find ways. Like one of my favorite stories, even yet to this day to tell, when I'm trying to explain to people why that last three feet of the of the buying journey is the most important. I literally give an example of my life. I remember when, and I'm dating myself. I remember when I was a kid and you may remember, you, you probably might not be old enough, but do you remember when Pepsi clear came out? It was an actual Pepsi Cola that was completely clear. They didn't add the caramel color to it. They actually yeah. made it so they were clear. So watching an ad on television, Pepsi Clear, mom, we got to have the Pepsi Clear. We got to have the Pepsi Clear. So we go to the store to get the Pepsi Clear and we get to the store and there's a gigantic display of Coke Clear. What do you think we left with? Coke Clear. So Pepsi paid all this money to advertise to me somewhere other than where the buying decision is made and Coke built a display right there at point of purchase and I left with Coke clear. And that's, it, this is, this is what goes on. You know, people, if they'll stop and think their buying decisions are always being made right there. You, maybe you thought you had the right brand, but you're checking the prices on the different quantities or whatever you're making buying decisions. And the vast majority of those buying decisions are literally made at point of purchase. That's never going to change coupons affect it in certain ways and people use discount programs but you are influenced because you're in the heat of that moment and and that's when you're willing to try new things that's when there's education to say why this is better and that's and that's the story i tell people to try to educate them to why that last couple of inches you know the last 10 yards are the only 10 that matter right yeah and, and that's, that's a better Dude, a hundred percent. I mean, you know, as you bring that up, I can't tell you how much that applies to me too. I mean, you know, uh, for most of us that are consumers, when we travel and we're going to a new state that's legal, it's a brand new experience. Every time you right. go into a different dispensary, you don't know what the local brands are. Uh, you don't know what the local products are and everything else. Mm -hmm. Even down here in Florida where I'm going into a store and I'm pretty much know what I'm going to get that last 10 yards or, or how you say it, is going to convince me what else am I going to try to add on to my purchase, right. right? Where What else am I going to tack onto it? Because I haven't tried everything and I want to educate myself too. I see how important that is. And it, it's amazing. This goes so much, what you guys do goes so far beyond just advertising. You know, I read some of the things that you guys are doing lately. You're going to have real time menu updates. where you are actually going to give bud tenders a remote control where they can put product up on the menu behind. Dude, that is oh, so oh, cool. Basically, it's lost. It's called on demand. And we built a library of the most common questions that consumers ask, like, how is a concentrate made? How will it make me feel? How do you consume it? How's a vape made? How's it make me feel? And so there's, a, if you really drill down and you interview bud tenders and you ask about that experience they have with individual consumers, you find out there's really a set of about 25 core questions most consumers ask. And it's about, you know, how something's made, how it makes them feel, and how to use it on about six different product lines, edibles, vapes, flour, tinctures, that sort of thing. And so it's pre-built out of the box. So you can override the menu or the digital sign and 
pull a video up answering that question. So you put the power in the bud tender's hands and then the bud tenders don't have to be knowledgeable. A lot of bud tenders, you know, I didn't say it, but I've heard it coined that they're the fast food worker of the industry. And if there is high turnover there, there very much is. And there's training issues. A lot of companies are making software and technologies to do that. And this is our contribution to that effort. You can take very non-skilled, non-trained bud tenders and as long as they know how to operate a remote control and listen to a consumer's questions, they can queue up the information that consumer needs. And so, yeah. Uh, one other thing I want to mention, you were talking a minute ago, just to circle back, and I was telling a story about Coke Clear and Pepsi Clear. Fun, funny story. You'll find this one interesting. So th this is one of our failures. That is a, it's a, it's a odd sort of a failure, right? All so, right. And so, we, we decide, one of my things is I like to come up with new segments for the show. How to, trivia, a lot of those ideals are mine. I enjoy that a lot. And I'll search mm -hmm. for things that I can put in a collection and call it a segment. And so I come up with a segment that I wanted to feature these random exotic strains that you've never heard of in your life, right? That somebody just come up with, it's crazy looking. And so I would find these strains and we get the images of them. And we, so we built out like 10 episodes for a segment. And so we launched the first segment of this crazy exotic train. I don't remember a funky monkey or something. Who knows? So the next thing you know, the phone at the office is exploding. It's marijuana dispensaries. And they're like, man, you got to get that segment off of my screen because everybody wants the funky monkey. I don't even know what funky monkey is. And he's like, you got to, it's got to go. I don't have the funky monkey. And that's not what it was called. I'm being funny, but, but it was, it was one of those interesting failures where I thought I had an excellent segment. And then we just kind of really learned the power of suggestion at the point of purchase. We were upsetting people. We were upsetting consumers because they couldn't buy things. The dispensary managers were upset because we're trying to sell things that they don't have. It was, it was interesting. It was, I, I thought you'd enjoy that story. Dude, that's, that's hilarious. I might, I honestly probably would end up being one of those people. I'm like, Oh man, that looks so cool. Let me get that. You know, I, I can tell you here in the state of Florida, we already have an issue with, you know, you walk into a store, you look at the menu and they have like a third of it at best, but right. you know, it's, well, uh, they need, they need I, enlightened I, menus. Ours upgrade on the POS. So if you get to a low quantity or no quantity, it automatically falls off. So well, we should certainly this. bring you down here and make some introductions. Right. I'm all about making my personal experience better if I can. So, <laughs> I, I, you, me too. Believe that. I, I do my own product research. Believe that. I don't. I trust no yeah. one. <laughs> yeah, I heard you guys talking about that on Let's Be Blunt. I mean, that's got to <laughs> honestly. I can imagine one of the cool experiences for you is going to dispensaries and kind of going through their experience and then saying, all right, we could enhance it this way. We can enhance it that way. Or even going into one of the dispensaries that you did help after the fact and experience, I don't even know how to phrase this, experiencing the experience you created, right? That's yeah. got to be yeah. a really cool feeling. Well, to your point, so cannabis is so unusual because if I said I was going to build a clothing store, in your brain right now, you just built a clothing store and it had racks on the floor and there were some racks on the walls and there were sort of different aisles. Like you built that in your mind and there was a cash wrap on the side or in the back. And, you know, that, that's what, and there was tables with the jeans folded. Like, that's what you saw just now. All mm -hmm. clothing stores are virtually the same. All restaurants are virtually the same. Jewelry stores are all virtually the same. Cannabis is interesting. And one of my favorite things about it was how that there was no preset model. And so initially in the beginning, what I began to notice, and we had to develop different technologies for different models, but a lot of everything fell into one of two models. One model I call the jewelry store model. And the jewelry mm -hmm. store model is just like going to a jewelry store. A bunch of stuff in cases you point, say, can I see that? They get that out. When you say you want it, they take it from you and they set it on the back counter and you have a pile that begins to form. And when you're ready to go, that person grabs the product, takes you to cash wrap, and checks you out and out the door you go. Then there's the pharmacy model where you don't freely roam around the store until somebody sees you're ready to buy. You got to stand in line and you're waiting to talk to one guy. And then once you get to him, he has undivided attention. And in that model, like every station needs its own digital menus. It has to have every product in it in order for that to be successful. And so those are two of the, the more prevalent 
uh, layouts that I've seen inside of Canvas. I'm seeing a lot of hybrids now. I'm helping a lot of people build hybrids. Uh, you know, I'm seeing some people from other retail segments come in with good suggestions. But to your point, Todd, it's incredible that there isn't like a predetermined format and we're all making this up as we go along. And I've actually seen customers that go, well, I don't really like that store. And I'll be like, why don't you like the store? Well, I don't like the way it works. I don't want to, I don't want to stand in line. Like, you know, some people like native roots because you get in and out real fast in Colorado. But some people don't like native roots because they don't want that one-on-one -on -one with that bud tender. They just want to pick their stuff, get in line and check out. And so to each his own. And and that that is exciting about cannabis. I'm always looking for to see what the new model is. Cure Leaf right now is touting the heck out of their new model. You know, I see your Cure Leaf, uh, you know, uh, drink cup over there. And and I love those guys. I know those guys have been customers. They've been customers of mine for since the beginning. One of their original CEOs is one of our investors and board members. And so know a lot about them. And, and so they're touting a new model where they've evolved to get away from that medical feel that was very Cure Leaf, very medical. Yeah. And, you know, it felt like you were at the clinic, if you will, or the pharmacy. I don't know. So some sort of medical thing. And now it's a much more alive, earthy wood grains and stuff. And so it's really, it's really neat to see all of that. Dude, I mean, you know, you bring up a good point. Like, I can tell you multiple memorable experiences that I've had in dispensaries. I, one of my favorite pastimes is going somewhere new and going to a few local dispensaries. Listen, I'm going to apologize to any bud tender that sees me walk into your store. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm going to eat up a ton of your time. I will make a nice purchase. I know you guys probably don't work on commission all the time, but listen, I, my favorite pastime is going in and bullshitting with bud tenders about the local market and everything else. Um, you know, I've done it a lot. And I can tell you many memorable experiences that I've had. And when I look at just a traditional retail landscape, I can't tell you a clothing store or a shoe store or anything else that I've had a truly memorable experience. I'm like, you've got to go check out this store or anything else. I mean, I've seen some odd clothing stores, like some apparel stores, there's a company called Bonobos that just has fit shops where you go in, you try on the clothes, you order it, they send it to your house. And that's kind of interesting. Cool. But I can tell you, I remember... The first dispensary that I remember, Green Dragon out in uh, Breckenridge, Colorado, and I remember seeing they had the jars on the table with the little vents, and then in the middle, they had the coffee beans and just clear your nose. And I remember yeah. that like it was yesterday. And then like uh, the I think apothecary. Yeah. Exactly. And then Apothecary in, uh, in San Diego San was Diego. the first one that I saw where product was on the shelf. Like I could, right. they just let me walk around and touch stuff. And I'm like, this is so cool. I'm touching things. And I had happened to go with uh, somebody who had never been to a dispensary before. And I literally, I think I took an hour and a half in the store, just grabbing products and educating people and everything else. And like, I actually had people in the store like, sir, can you help me with this? I'm like, no, I don't work here. I'm just very excited. <laughs> so, you know, it, it, it's crazy. And I have not even gotten to a point where I've been in a lot of the dispensaries that you support. So I can't wait for that. Cause I know the closest thing I probably got to it was planet 13. But I know that, you know, judging on everything that you guys are doing, I can't wait to work and in, walk into a cure leaf or somewhere else where you guys are doing it and see it firsthand. Because I know in my mind, that's going to be the dispensary that I take my friends to for the first time as they're getting their cards here in Florida. Hey, man, you got to come with me to this place. You, you're going to love it. And I think everybody else, you know, you see me getting here and you see how excited I get telling you these dispensary stories. I want other people to have that too. And Honestly, man, companies like yours, and I say this all the time, the companies that give us the, the cannabis industry the best first impression to the general public are the most important companies in this industry to me. And I thank you for that. Well, I appreciate it. And I'll tell you where it really sort of came from is the first time I, I'm, I don't get intimidated. You might pick that up on my personality. I, I don't bullshit people. I'm pretty straight shooter. And sometimes too blunt is what people say. And, you know, I, I played uh, fiddle contests and things been in front of 20,000 people public speaking. So I just don't, I'm not intimidated by any situation. And I remember the first time I walked into a marijuana dispensary, I was intimidated. I hadn't felt that feeling a long time. I didn't even really know what it was, but it's like a queasy feeling. And it's because there's so many smells that hit you in the face and all the lingo that you're hearing. Like I didn't know what a terpene was until I went into a cannabis dispensary. I've been smoking yeah. my entire life. What's a, I didn't know what a cannabinoid was. I just knew there was THC in it and I got high. You know, and they, they'd say one brings you up, the other brings, I knew nothing. 
And so you walk in, I don't know what to say to these people. I'm, I'm halfway afraid I'm going to embarrass myself, you know, because they're all talking this lingo. There's smells everywhere, the sounds. It was intimidating. And I remember that feeling. And I remember how it would have been neat if I could just go up to a kiosk or stare at a screen for a second, get my bearings, get a little education, gain some comfortability, and then go at it. But that was, you know, that wasn't it. You, back then, you're just thrown to the wolves. Yeah. There's people in line with a bunch of mud tenders. And so that, that, that was the thing I wanted to stop from happening to people. I wanted people to walk in. doesn't matter if you're an extrovert, introvert, want to self-educate before you come, self-educate at the store, whatever you are, whatever kind of individual you are, you're able to go there and have that experience. So it's multifaceted and, and it fits everybody. That's, that's what I've wanted. And that's what we keep trying to create for people. Dude, you, you've, you've done it, man. I, I can look and I can tell I you so. like some, some of the dispensaries that I look at, like if sending my mom or my dad there, if they were to get something just like, they're not going to get a good experience because they don't have the education that I have. And even with my education, it, it's hard to have that experience. But the way that you've done it where you're educating people as they're in line, they can start picking out the different things that they want. I mean, you're talking to somebody, when I go out to eat to a new restaurant, I study that menu before I go. So I can have a game plan when I order. And I'm starting to do that with cannabis too. But, you know, if I'm going to travel and I'm going to go to California or Oregon or somewhere else, I'm definitely going to look for the dispensaries that you're working with. So this way I know that while I'm waiting there, I'm going to have that experience. I get to share it with the people that I'm with. And that really excites me, man. Like I said, awesome. the companies in this industry that are normalizing it and bringing in the rest of the community that are not avid cannabis users, those are going to be the most important companies that we can have here. And that, well, pretty soon awesome. you'll be able to go to our self-service portal that'll be launching next month and see where all these dispensaries are. They'll be open and available to buy ads in and, and just see where the, see where you can go, you know, get an enlightened experience, if you will. Absolutely, man. Well, I will tell you firsthand, if you need a beta tester for anything, I will volunteer <laughs> myself easily. You know, if you need to test to see if any podcasts work on your network, no, just, I, just saying, man. <laughs> you know, actually, we got to get together on that because obviously I do promote segments that we're in. So we, it's, it's a, it's a great trade. It's a, another gift to the community. I mean, you're, you, you were gracious enough to have me on the podcast. It's the least I can do to make sure people are out there watching and, and we reach that audience. And like I said, we are in front of a lot of consumers. So, so we got to get swing back together after the recording today. Absolutely, man. Well, like I said, I'm just glad to be in your atmosphere. I'm, I'm, I'm happy that I got the invite to the bus and don't think I'm not going to take you up on that <laughs> offer for the next I'll let you drive it. around. You can actually Oof. drive it with a driver's license. It's crazy, but it's well, true. I, I, I will drive it before we hang out on it. Let's, let's put it that way. We've yeah, got to make right? sure we do it in that order. Right. <laughs> well, man, I've taken up an hour of your time and there, I don't even know how I can get an hour of your time with all the things that you do. Is there anything that we missed in this conversation? Because I know Enlighten covers so many different aspects of the industry. It's just a model that nobody else really has. And, and it's incredible yeah. what you guys are doing. I would encourage people to go to the website because we're growing and evolving. Uh, you know, we see people that do, you know, maybe one or two of the things that we do and they don't have the interconnectivity with the rest of the tech stack and with the data that we have. I would encourage, you know, any brand or any dispensary to come check it out. There is a marketing side of the house and a retail side. So we have products for everybody that seamlessly fit together in our smart hub platforms. Just check us out. Give us a call. Ask for a demo of, We've evolved a lot through the years and you, you know, you need to be aware of the tools that we have to provide. So I would just encourage people to check out the website, get enlightened.io. Absolutely. And it, it is a phenomenal website, folks. It's very educational, very self-explanatory. I highly recommend going it. And just to if I can give you one more endorsement, folks, yeah. he's not just doing this for the cannabis industry. He's doing it for everybody. It's just, this is, this is the cannabis focused entity right here. So if you this want someone business. who has real, this is the only thing I do anymore. Let's be honest. I gave up the food business. I, I still work in it, but I don't have any passion for it. This is, this is the fun part. But yeah, we're bringing those tools. We, we definitely are. Well, this, listen, is my, you, this is where my heart's at. This is where it's at. They are tried, tested, and true. And I'm glad that you're bringing your expertise to our industry, my friend. Thank you again for doing this show. And thank you for everything that you do. And like you said, you've got news dropping in January. And, you know, if you're going to blurt it out early, I'd love for you to blurt it out here. So we'll, yeah, we'll definitely get come, you back. 
come September, you're going to see some self-service stuff, and, and we'll get back on a podcast for January, and I'll leak some more information and get in more trouble for my lawyers. <laughs> Dude, when we start getting into more shows where we don't focus so much on, you know, when we just have more of a conversation, I would love just to have you come on and bullshit with Call me, man. I'd I love I'll bullshit with you anytime you want to. We'll talk about whatever you want to talk about in the industry. I don't just know about the technology. I, I'm fortunate like you to get to sit on the couch next to the kings of all different sectors of the industry. And so I, I would love to sit and chat. Absolutely, dude. I would love to pick your brain. And like I said, I've listened to a lot of the interviews you've done. And I love, I love your knowledge. I love your soapboxes because I love anybody who gets on a nice rant. So yeah. I'm a big fan. I, do, I, I do appreciate that, it, man. For sure. Well, thank you for having me, Todd. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thank you. And thank you, everybody, again at home. Uh, this has been another episode of Elevate Your Grind. Join us tomorrow again live at 5 p.m. Eastern, facebook.com slash Canna Business Group. Uh, we've got Christian Shank from Driven Delivery. Sorry, I'm trying to control this mess as we're promoting so five o'clock eastern tomorrow check us out on youtube youtube.com slash elevate your grind we've gotten our entire library of interviews there there's some great ones i think we're over 60 episodes at this point uh make sure you subscribe so you get alerts when we come out with new videos and we will see you tomorrow this has been another episode of elevate your grind we are out